Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Uh, as a lot of you, the listeners out there will know, I've talked a lot about free will. I've had a lot of philosophers and theologians of free will come on and talk about it. And today is uh, another episode of that. So uh, lock yourselves in. It's going to be pretty sweet. I'm really excited about it. Today I have another special guest with me, Dr. Michael Preciado. And uh, Michael Preciado is a minister in the Presbyterian Church in America. He's happily married and the father of two wonderful children. He holds a BA and MA in philosophy, uh, an MDiv from Westminster Seminary, California, and a PhD in philosophical theology from the University of Aberdeen. And today we're going to be talking about his new book, A Reformed View of Freedom. So uh, without further ado here, Michael, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I... I first came across this because we're Facebook friends and yeah. uh, man, your uh, Facebook profile is like uh, someone from Paw Patrol. Paw Patrol <laughs> That's right. right. Well, my son loves Paw Patrol. So I put that up for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Who, who is that? Wait, which one is that? Chase. Chase. I should know that from my nieces and nephews. <laughs> they love Paw Patrol. Uh, so, so then you, you shared this book and it was kind of on my radar, but I'm like, you know, I, I don't know uh, if Chase wrote a book on free will or what. <laughs> and then uh, I'm, I'm in Dr. Van Hooser's course here at, at TED's uh, Providence and Divine Action. It's a seminar mm -hmm. course. So one of our PhD students, uh, Caleb Lingram, he did a book review of your book. And this was right after I read uh, the, Ru the Routledge book uh, on free will, uh, Modern oh. Introduction. So I had a lot of this stuff in my head and, and Caleb did an awesome job of reviewing your book, but all these terms kept popping up and I thought, man, this is awesome. Someone is, someone else is working on a reformed understanding of free will with uh, con the contemporary debate in mind. So I was really excited about that, reached out to you, you sent me a copy. And, uh, and now here we are. So I'm, I'm fired up to, to get into it. Um, just real quick, maybe you have studied philosophy, you studied theology and you studied philosophical theology. What made you want to emphasize um, or specialize in free will? That's a good question. Um, I've always had questions about free will, especially because I've been reformed for a number of years. And obviously some of the main objections to the reformed faith have to do with things like the problem of evil, uh, free will, moral responsibility. Uh, how can you be free if God decrees whatsoever comes to pass? So those questions have always been uh, of interest to me. Uh, originally when I did my, this is a version of my PhD dissertation. When I, when I originally was going to do uh, a PhD, I wanted to work with Paul Helm. Mm -hmm. And I had run two ideas by him. One was kind of fleshing out Van Til's transcendental argument. And the other one was uh, coming up with a model of compatibilism using the Reformed confessions and uh, the Reformed Orthodox theologians. And Helm was pretty much, he said, well, I don't know about the transcendental argument thing, but I'll do the compatibilism thing. So yeah. I was like, fine, I'll do that. I'm interested in both of them. That's awesome. Well, um, for those who don't know, you know, Paul Helm is just a legend in Reformed theology. And if you can get him to be your advisor, then that's a really good thing. And it's worth yeah, the thing it, that he would ask you to pick. It ended up being, though, that I, I didn't actually get him as my advisor. So <laughs> oh, I know. So well, he went forward ended up book, doing that least. topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, you went to you. You were at Aberdeen. Who who did you study with there? Well, I went through Highland Theological College. Are you okay. familiar with that? So Highland oh, is part yeah, of it's mm -hmm. in it's in Scotland too. It's it's part of the University of the Highlands and the Islands, but mm -hmm. it's a newer university, so it doesn't have PhD granting authority yet. So yeah. the University of Aberdeen takes that over. Oh, so right. I went through that college, uh, and the main reason being one, Paul Helm was there, but unfortunately I didn't get him. But two. I didn't have to actually live there. I, I could okay. do things. Uh, it's a, a purely research degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really nice. So um, I'm I'm looking into something like that myself. So we'll yeah, see. Yeah, it's a good program. You you mentioned Van Til and transcendental uh, argument. You know, I, I we haven't talked about this before, but now my I'm, I'm on edge here. Uh, <laughs> Are you a Van Tilian, or, or were you were you looking to flesh that out or attack it, or what was the the purpose? Yeah. There? A lot of it just depends on what you mean by Van Tilian, because uh, there have been so many times in the past I've described myself about that, like that, and people would then say, oh, so you're a fideist, or oh, so you don't think God, you don't think the non-believer knows anything. And I'm like, well, no, that's not 
that's not what I understand Van Til to be saying. Yeah. Um, so I believe that the transcendental argument is a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I've been hopeful for a number of years that somebody would pick it up and really flesh it out in an analytically rigorous way. Yeah. And uh, I'm not aware of anyone that's done that yet. So I'd always kind of had it in the back burner of my, um, in my mind that this is something I'm interested in as well. Um, now, the way it turned out, I ended up going down this route as opposed yeah. to that route. Well, don't, don't give up on that, man. We, we're, yeah. we're, so uh, a lot of my guests uh, are on either C.S. Lewis or uh, Cornelius Van Til. And so, mm. yeah, we've had a, a couple of folks on already to talk dissertations, their dissertations on Van Til. And, uh, oh, great. Yeah, so that's so that's been really fun. So um, that could be another conversation. I don't want to derail this one, but we should definitely sure, sure. have that conversation sometime too because I, I would definitely be interested in that. Uh, but so you, uh, in in laying out your view of compatibilism or semi-compatibilism, uh, we, we're going to have to probably uh, get into what you mean by those, but you sure. pull from modern philosophers like John Martin Fisher and Mark, I've never said his name out loud. So is it Mark uh, Revisa? Yes, that's the way I've heard it pronounced. Okay. Yeah, I, I never know because it's up in here and you think mm -hmm. you read all the yeah. stuff. Um, but, but the thrust of your book is, uh, it, well, it's called A Reformed View of Freedom. And the thrust is that Reformed theology denies the sourcehood condition, denies uh, the principle of alternate possibilities, affirms a type of reasons responsive theory, affirms uh, a type of subjectivist condition. Right. And then, uh, also you get into this uh, modern debate over uh, the bones of, of Edwards. Uh, between mm -hmm. Helm and, and Muller. And so uh, I want to touch on all of those if we can. I, I think sure. we'll have enough time here. But uh, so your 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 flavor of compatibilism is uh, is informed by guidance control. And so real quick, um, can you define what, what you mean by like compatibilism and then what you take to be semi-compatibilism? Sure. Um, compatibilism is, is just the basic idea that uh, free will and moral responsibility are compatible with determinism. Mm -hmm. okay. um, then uh, semi-compatibilism, uh, it, it's the idea that uh, you know, we'll give, it's not quite put this way, but we'll, we'll give free will to the libertarians mm -hmm. and we'll still hold to the idea that moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. Okay. So the way, in my opinion, it, it comes down to a little bit of a linguistic or terminological issue because uh, it's not as though semi-compatibilists don't believe in a some kind of compatibilist form of free will. Mm -hmm. It's just they've said pretty explicitly, you know, libertarian free will is not compatible with determinism. So yeah. if that's what you mean by free will, then we'll, we'll give you that and we'll, we'll hold to the idea that more responsibility is compatible with um, determinism. Okay. So yeah, we've um, we've talked about free will a number of times on, on the podcast and I found some helpful categories of like leeway freedom mm -hmm. uh, and leeway compat leeway compatibilism and incompatibilism, leeway being the, the principle of alternate possibilities. And so you're saying that uh, you, well, this is where it gets uh, tricky because right. I'm going I'm to ask you, I've always used the sourcehood uh, language to describe myself. And, and you say that, you know, reform theology ought to, to deny the source condition, the sourcehood condition, but, but I think we mean different things by it. So, that might be, um, yeah. So and I think we've we've talked on Facebook about this a little bit, right? But um, so I have it in the outlines. Let me just let me just hold my horses sure. here. Um, so you also talk about um, your view being a uh, holding to or using utilizing a moderate reasons responsive theory of human right. freedom. Um, so just real quickly, what's what's reason responsiveness? Yeah, so reason responsiveness, the general basic idea, is that. Uh, the essence of free will or, or moral responsibility is that the agent has the ability to respond to reasons in an appropriate manner. And then you get different forms of that, of which uh, moderate reason responsiveness or guidance control is one form of that. Fisher and Revisa then you know, spell it out in a little bit more of a rigorous way, what it means to be uh, appropriately responsive to reasons. Okay. And, and uh, there's like, they're strong reasons responsive and, and weak right. reasons um, it, Can you help us think through that? Sure. What would strong and weak look like? So the, the way in which Fisher and Revisa in the book arrive at uh, moderate reasons responsiveness is, is kind of like a, by, by laying out one form of reason responsiveness and then giving counterexamples to it and saying, well, that, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. So one is strong reasons responsiveness. And, and the idea there is that uh, to be morally responsible, the agent would have to recognize the reason 
uh, in all possible worlds to do otherwise, choose to do that and also actualize it in action. So there's a really tight fit between three components, the recognition, the choosing, and then the translating it into action. And Fisher reviews that they ultimately reject that because they say it doesn't, and, and they're right about this in my opinion, they, they say it doesn't account for uh, weakness of the will. Hmm. So there, we want to hold people responsible uh, for having a weak will. Like, so if you're, if you're, you're going to go get a, uh, into the refrigerator and you see a piece of chocolate cake and you're like, oh, you know, I have good reason not to eat that because it'll make my blood sugar go up or I'll get sick or whatever. Uh, but you ignore that reason and you eat it anyways. That's weakness of will. Yeah. And on the strong reasons responsiveness view, uh, that person would not be responsible. But intuitively, we want to hold that person responsible. We yeah. don't want to let them not get, let them off the hook. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that, that's a reason to not hold the, uh, the strong or how, how about the, the weak? Yeah. The weak one, they, they're a lot more favorable to in the course of the book, but they use it and then they kind of modify it. And they say that there are certain things that it can't account for. Um, like it's not say, it doesn't say that um, you perform the action for the reasons that you're doing it for, for the reasons that are given. Um, it, it also says that it doesn't specify that there are moral reasons that you need to take into account. So it's kind of hard to explain in a nutshell, but they give a bunch of different counter examples that show how these things are necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and that we, the weak reasons account does not account for those. So then they say there's gotta be something in between somewhere. And right. obviously there's gonna be a range and that's where they get moderate reasons responsiveness from. Okay, yeah, it, that makes sense when you lay it out like that. It's like it's like Goldilocks and Goldilocks and her porridge. You know, strong is too hot <laughs> and, and weak too too. That's uh, right. Good. Yeah, yeah, that and that makes sense because a, a weak version would be too weak. The the response to the reasons isn't you can respond to the wrong reasons or whatever, and strong mm. is too strong. Okay, so so somewhere in between, there's this moderate reasons responsive theory of human freedom, and um, do does Fisher do they say that um that this is this also can work with uh, a libertarian conception or is this solely a compatibilist notion? yeah no they make it clear they don't explore it in their book but they do say that they're they're attempting to give a an account of moral responsibility that is compatible with uh, determinism or incompatibilism okay okay yeah because I, I can understand uh, from a determinism uh, a determinist perspective yeah you're you just determined to believe these reasons uh, mm -hmm. and act on these reasons in a moderate way. Right. Um, and then I'm wondering about a libertarian. I mean, you didn't write about this and you would reject libertarian view, but I, I'm wondering right. how a, a libertarian might res might appropriate a moderate reasons responsive theory. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, that would be an interesting project to take up. I, I mean, I think it would kind of depend upon how they view the relationship between reasons and actions. Uh, mm -hmm. Where would they locate the, the indeterminism. Yeah. Um, but, but you, I mean, just thinking about it off the top of my head, uh, you, you could imagine maybe indeterminism being prior to the formation of reasons and then the agent, you know, acting based upon those reasons. Uh, yeah. this is a, a very, you know, overly simplified approach to it, but I could see something like that being argued and it's still a reasoned responsive view. Yeah. And you can say that they're moderately reasoned responsive. It's just you you locate indeterminism somewhere in there. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that that might that might fit with like a, a source libertarian view or, so, or something. Yeah. Okay. I think that's right. Okay. So then moving on we have uh me mechanism ownership. Right. Um, can can you help us with that one? So this is uh sometimes they call it um the historicist condition hmm. on responsibility. And it's basically the idea that uh, it's not enough to be moderately reasons responsive to be morally responsible, but you also have to be able to see yourself as an agent and see yourself as being an apt target of praise and blame or what sometimes called the reactive attitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, and you think about it, it's pretty intuitive. If somebody really didn't view themselves as, as being an agent or as, as being blamable, we would think that there's something wrong with that person. We would think, well, that's just really odd that you, you, you don't think that you're an agent or you don't think that you're 
capable or an apt target of, of praise or blame when you do something right or do something wrong. Mm -hmm. So they are going to use that and say, um, that's the second part of guidance control. So you need to have moderate reasons, responsiveness, and you need to have mechanism ownership or what they call sometimes a historicist or, or even the subjectivist condition. Okay. Yeah, that this this is interesting for me. Uh, it it overlaps with some uh, epistemology that I've read. Um, mm. Jim Jim Slagle has this book, Epistemological Skyhook, and I was interested in it because it's it's similar to like a Ventilian transcendental argument and C.S. Lewis's argument from reason. But he gives these three conditions uh, to be to be uh, to have justification. Uh, there's a couple necessary conditions that you have a, a reason for your belief, you have a, a good reason, and then it has to be your reason. And he uses mm -hmm. this to argue against naturalistic determinism. Okay. Um, and I'm, um, I'm writing a paper right now showing why it, it is a good argument against naturalistic determinism, but not against theological determinism. Mm -hmm. And I think that that good reason or uh, your reason, I think it matches up well with this mechanism ownership that, yeah, you have to be able to respond to reasons, but you also, it has to be your reason. It can't be... Right. It can't be an evil scientist put it in your in a mechanism in your brain to make you come to this. Is that is that what this is getting that, at? I think that's exactly right because uh, they they introduce this. Uh, well, I shouldn't say introduce it. It's part of their theory, but it one of the functions that it has is to help rebut manipulation arguments. Yeah, because if you if a, if someone was manipulating you in in some uh, some kind of way, that wouldn't be you wouldn't have mechanism ownership. Someone else would be would have that. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't be taking ownership of your of your well what they call the mechanism or really just means the way in which you came to this action. Yeah, it would it would be like a, an alien mechanism working to give you this. That's reason. right. So right. so so that's why these are two conditions that are important. So you could be reasons responsive and be controlled or manipulated, right. and it doesn't count. Right. So you need at least these two conditions here. Right. Exactly. Um, and and so um, mechanism ownership. Is this synonymous with that uh, subjectivist? Uh, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Basically the same thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so then you move on to, uh, you, you deny PAP, and I'm excited about that. <laughs> I, I love anytime someone goes at, at PAP. But why ought a uh, reformed theologian deny PAP? I know that uh, as I grew up in like the, the new Calvinism kind of stuff, pulling from Piper, and then I got into theology and philosophy, Naturally, I just thought, of course, uh, uh, a, a, a Calvinist ought to be compatibilist, ought to be theological determinist. We ought to deny PAP. And I get into some more recent theology and stuff, mm -hmm. and people are like, oh, you, you know, Oliver Chris kind of tossing out there. Maybe we could be a libertarian Calvinist. And and right. Mueller, you know, wrote this whole book, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to bring it in through the history. But why do you think a, a Reformed theologian needs to deny PAP? Yeah, in, in the book, I, I address uh, Oliver Crisp, his libertarian mm -hmm. Calvinism, uh, another school or group of thinkers called the, well, known as the Utrecht thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, they appropriate uh, uh, an insight from Dun Scotus that they call synchronic contingency. Uh, and then obviously Richard Muller, who he has a thesis that um, freedom basically amounts to, you know, these multiple potencies that you have. So you can do uh, the liberty you can have the liberty of contradiction, which is I can do A or or not A, or the liberty of contrariety, which is I can do A, B, C, or D, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically sounds a lot like libertarianism or like right. PAP. Um, and so what I did is uh, from a historical and then a philosophical approach, I hopefully demonstrated that our our tradition uh, does not allow for that mm -hmm. uh, because of God's decree, because of His providence. Uh, a form of theological determinism has to be affirmed and theological determinism here, meaning, you know, that God decrees X to happen at T1 and we don't possess the ability to thwart T from happening at T1. Or else God would not be, you know, omnipotent or his plan right. would fail. All, all sorts of problems with us right. being able to change the divine decree. Exactly. Or act contrary to the divine decree. Exactly. So, that just makes so much sense to me. That just seems mm -hmm. like if you are a Calvinist of any stripe, that needs to be affirmed because a Calvinist believes that God is sovereign overall in that strong sense of sovereignty. Right. Such that, you know, yeah, he's decreed. He said X will happen. And that means if X is going to happen, I don't have 
uh, a contrary choice. I'm, I can't go with why, otherwise right. I'm wrong and God's never right. wrong. And, and for different reasons, right? There's like, he has exhaustive foreknowledge, but he also has exhaustive foreknowledge because of his meticulous, meticulous providence, uh, which is, you know, based on his, uh, his free knowledge and his, his, uh, necessary knowledge. And, um, it's not necessary knowledge. It's free knowledge and uh, natural knowledge. Natural, natural knowledge, right? Um, so, yeah, that that makes so much sense to me. But um, can you, you 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 wrote a lot about this, so it's it's going to be hard to kind of summarize. But you brought this uh, this debate over Jonathan Edwards up. Uh, it, it's happening in in the modern uh, conversation. Can right. you kind of like repersonate that, or just kind of go sure. over the the the, the players, the, those two key players you talk about, Helm and Mueller? Uh, right, two giants in uh, reform theology, mm -hmm. but yeah, what's the debate about? Yeah, so a while ago, I forget exactly. It might have been 2011. Uh, Richard Mueller came out with a paper, and it was entitled something to the effect of uh, Jonathan Edwards' free will and the parting of the ways. Mm -hmm. And he made the argument that Jonathan Edwards' view in uh, his massive book, Freedom of the Will, uh, actually departs from the reformed tradition, mm -hmm. and so he starts talking about a number of different things here, but uh, one of the things that it comes down to is that uh, he wants to hold that the Reformed Orthodox and the Reformed tradition held to what he calls multiple potencies, what, what I kind of outlined before. So an agent then on this view, if you, if you held the entire history of the universe to be the same up to point T, the, the agent would have potencies to do either A or not A, B, C, or D. Right. Yeah. So that sounds like libertarian freedom. Uh, he denies that that it is. And, and I, I don't think that it is exactly either. I think what, what he's really trying to get at is that there is this kind of a general power or ability that the will has. Mm -hmm. But um, Helm comes in and he hears the same kinds of uh, concerns and thinking, well, this sounds a lot like libertarian freedom. And he does more of an analysis in terms of uh, the specifics of particular reformed Orthodox theologians, like a, like a Turretin or someone. Mm -hmm. And he not only gives philosophical arguments against Mueller's view of multiple potencies, but also textual arguments uh, from the reformed Orthodox themselves. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I love when two like Titans like that, who yeah. usually they're on that. So they've been on the same side against some of my other heroes in the Vantillian mm -hmm. camp. And so it's kind of nice to see they, to me, they both kind of come more from the historic camp. Um, uh, though Paul Helm, I mean, first rate uh, philosophical theologian as well, but, but uh, like they've gone at John frame, who is just one of my, one of my heroes. But so it's kind of interesting to see them kind of, uh, duking right. out. but I wonder like, wh what does Mueller think? Um, Cause he, he knows he's already forgotten more about reformed theology than I will ever learn. Um, uh, but so, so how does he understand this multiple potencies in light of the divine decree? Does he think we can yeah. act contrary to it? Uh, he would say yes, uh, he, he in, but he means it in a different sense. He would, he would say we have potencies to act contrary to it. Um, but not that we actually will. Can, can those potencies just never be actualized then or something? Yeah, the potencies to be to the contrary of what God decrees cannot be actualized. Okay. And so he kind of, in my opinion, uh, he's unclear in his terminology, because yeah. in my opinion, what he's doing there, uh, if he's going to say they can't be actualized, and he's affirming basically what compatibilists say. Right, right. But he doesn't want to say that he's a compatibilist. And he you know, genuinely believes that he, his view is not a compatibilist view. And a lot of it comes down in my view to how are you defining these terms? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he, and in his book, and, and even in his newest book on um, uh, William Perkins, he gets into some of this as well. And, and he doesn't really give the standard definitions of, of compatibilism, yeah. you know, determinism, et cetera, et cetera. He has, Kind of an idiosyncratic understanding of them, especially at the end of his book, uh, Divine uh, Divine Choice and Human Choice. He, he gives like yeah. three examples where he says something to the effect of, if you mean this by compatibilism, then reform theology is not. If you mean this by libertarianism, then reform theology is not. But none of those examples he gives are standard understandings yeah. of what compatibilism and libertarianism is. 
Yeah, I've I've been so I'm a theology student. I'm working on a couple of masters here at Trinity, but I I really really love philosophy, and part of me wishes like I'm I'm Lord willing I'm going to go on to philosophy, but I, I take a lot of time to study philosophy, and there's so many times that it's it's talking they're talking back, yeah. past each other, and I think the theologians they're using oftentimes there's very good theologians uh, and even very good ones who make this mistake, I think, but they're talking liberty of indifference, liberty of spontaneity. And then I go and I talk to my philosopher friends and I'm like, bro, we don't use that language. It's been years. That's from (laughs) the middle ages. That's right. And and yeah, they still kind of map on, but there's been so much uh, growth and progress. And uh, as, as you've, you know, elucidated here in in your book, the philosopher, there are philosophers of free will who spend all their, all their time researching this stuff. And to to ignore them and to say, well, I'm going to make up my own idiosyncratic uh, way, or I'm going to go back to Edwards and just use the exact language he said instead of saying, here's Edwards, here's how it maps on, or here's how it doesn't, but right. here's where Edwards might have been today, you know, and, and that's what I appreciate about about your work because it needs to be updated, it needs to be in conversation with modern uh, philosophy, especially if their whole job is talking about free will, where yours is, right. you know, looking at the theologians and stuff. So. I've, I found that to be helpful, and I, I, it's discouraging when I see theologians, some of them, so you got the historic guys who won't let go of that language, you got the newer guys who make up, just make up their own categories. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's frustrating, because because it's, I want to have this unified conversation, and oftentimes yeah. it's not. I feel your, your pain there, and you know what, I, uh, one of the purposes of this book is is exactly that, it's, it's kind of an, in a sense an exercise in resourcement as well as analytic theology. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to say where would the Reformed Orthodox be on the contemporary map of free will and moral responsibility? Yeah, yeah. totally. So that, that brings me to, to one last question here on, on uh, PAP, the principle of alternate possibilities. Do you reject uh, uh, do you and should Reformed theologians reject PAP just simplicit or just, uh, just no PAP at all? Or do you make the distinction between like a categorical ability of, of, of PAP or understanding of PAP and a conditional uh, yeah. PAP? Because I've, I've talked, I'm going to, we'll see if we can have kind of a conversation uh, between Taylor Sear and Guillaume Bignon who, who take ah. different sides on that. But uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts, if, if you've thought through that at all. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to what exactly is meant. Uh, the, the conditional analysis on the ability to do otherwise, I, I take is is just an expression of a general power. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, I would totally affirm that. Uh, okay. Obviously, if you don't have a, a, a general power to do something, then how could you be held responsible for that? Yeah. Um, the question comes down to whether or not that particular way of stating it is the best way of stating it and i don't even have a problem with that i i I would state it in terms of you know if uh, one one way of understanding if somebody has a general power to do something is if he willed to do x he would do x yeah yeah and i think i could be totally wrong in moth base here but i think that might be what muller is getting at with his multiple potencies yes it's like Yeah. yeah you have this conditional pap and if you could just say that that would be very helpful. <laughs> you know, I I understand. Yeah, that. I agree. We want to we want to be fair to the to the historical side for sure. Just bring it up to date with us and let us know if that's what you're talking about. Because then we could say yes or no. And and really, it's not that big of a deal. Even you know amongst Calvinists mm-hmm. uh, and philosophers who some some say no pap at all. We don't need it. And they say, well, yeah, you know, if you prove pap if uh, uh, I don't know if pap if is unique to uh, Guillaume Bignon, but uh, the con- conditional pap, no problem. That's all right. Mm-hmm. If you end up proving that, it doesn't destroy my my view at all. So yeah, it's just yeah. an interesting debate, but I, I think that would be helpful for uh, for us t- <laughs> to be able to talk about. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. So this brings us to the the sourcehood, uh, and and you you mentioned this like earlier in your book, I believe, but uh, you didn't, you deny the sourcehood condition. Um, and, and I've, as a, as a reformed compatibilist, I've always considered myself a sourcehood compatibilist that, that it's, um, I'm free in so far as I can act on my desires, my desires are the source. Um, but, but you deny this. And I think it's, it's because of uh, a particular view that, that you are the ultimate source or something. So can you just ex- explain what you right. mean by source, uh, source so, condition? Yeah, so Fisher in, in a number of his works, he'll he'll talk about you know, being the source or the ultimate source. 
uh, and how that's incompatible with determinism. Mm -hmm. And on all that basically means is that uh, the idea of the source of condition is that if you are going to be held, if you are free or morally responsible, then you must be the ultimate source of your actions. Nothing outside of you could be a cause, whether it be the decrees of God or the laws of physics or, or something else. Hmm. Um, and I think it just seems obvious to me that a somebody who believes in, in God's decree in a reformed sense would have to deny that because God's decree is in a sense outside of us and it determines what all of our actions are. Yeah. Well, and that and that makes so much sense. I mean, uh, with that definition, I would agree with you. I don't understand what why they need to go with that definition because the mm. other the other stuff I've read on it is just like they believe uh, other source compatibilists would say that you could be determined by the laws of nature and still uh, have have free will. They probably wouldn't say that, but be morally responsible. They would say. So that, that that was interesting to me to find that they have taken a uh, yeah a more nuanced view of sourcehood condition and and if that is if that becomes the uh, the standard then yeah I'll, I'll need to uh, deny that as well uh, I guess what I've thought of as sourcehood was that yeah the the desire kind of motif that you're acting mm -hmm. on your own desires that as long as and and you brought this up in your book I believe that as long as you are um, not hindered from acting on your desires at all, then then you're free to do so. Then you are you're free, even if you were right. determined uh, by God for sure. Yeah, you were free because you wanted to do it. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's definitely part of uh, what the Reformed Orthodox were saying. That uh, it's their notion of rational spontaneity or rational willingness is the idea that the rational part is what I'm calling the primitive form of reason responsive theory, mm -hmm. and then the yeah. spontaneity part is. You're, you're performing the action in an uncoerced manner or an unforced manner. Yeah. So you're, you're willing to do it or free to do it in that sense. Yeah. And so, um, so if you were manipulated to do something, that's not, uh, well, it's, it, it messes with the, uh, the ownership. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't your choice. You didn't want to do it. Uh, even if you, if you're being forced to respond to some reasons, look, it, it's not coming from you. You're not the owner. Right. Um, that that ownership condition, uh, that's what I think of as sourcehood. So I think that matches up pretty mm -hmm. well. Um, okay. That that you are you are the source. It's it's your reasons that you're acting on, even though they have been decreed by God from before the foundation of the world. He's decreed it such that you will form that reason. And I think for right. me this is this is uh, really timely because I'm writing my master's thesis on uh, the authorial analogy of of providence. Okay, and um, and so I think it works perfectly because um, yes. how how is it that God could you know de determine that I have uh, the reasons that I have and still me have mechanical uh, owner mechanism ownership? Well, because He's determined you not uh, like a robot and and not as a bad author would do, where it's just ex machina drops reasons mm -hmm. in your head, but within the context that you live, He's 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 decreed everything that that comes to happen that comes to pass. So. He's decreed that I would uh, choose to do this podcast with you. Right. And so, you know, at this level outside the story, he's writing that. And within the story, I have my reasons. They're good reasons. They're my reasons. And uh, and I'm acting on them freely. I'm not being coerced. He didn't have to put a chip in my head. And uh, I think Guillaume Bignon also talks about a, um, I know that he talks about this. I interviewed on him, uh, a God-givenness condition. So Yeah, you he, mentioned that. I you yeah, know, I read his I read his book when it first came out, and yeah. I I, just, I can't remember what what that meant. Yeah, yeah, uh, I had to read it again too. But um, okay. it it was he used that against the manipulation argument. Um, okay. so to to say that there is a um significant difference between the 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 analogy of a, a manipulator and God, and the significant difference is that a manipulator is manipulating you against your God given character. Um, mm. But but God could never manipulate you against your his your God given character, uh, because He's God and He rightfully right. does that and He rightfully again I think the authorial analogy helps so much He rightfully put you in that situation to develop your character He put you in this one He had you talk to this person You're thinking about this He knows what you would do in this case in this case um, But not like because of some middle knowledge But because He's decreed it to happen such right. that you would so. Yeah, the, the God givenness uh, is like your character, and so mm. I'm I'm acting outside. I'm acting out of my character, 
But if someone comes and manipulates me to act in a different way that that doesn't fit with my God given character, then that was that's wrong. I, I'm been I've been manipulated, and yeah, I think yeah, that, that's right. Importantly, because a cre a creature acting on the created level like God in that way is so inappropriate. And that's why it doesn't work. The, the author can do that. But if another character in the story tries to be the author of another character, it yeah. doesn't work at all. That's really interesting. It's uh, I, I, So the terminology I use, I think, is capturing what Fisher and Revisa are saying, but they don't exactly use it. I, I use it, the terminology of the distinction between the ordinary way in which mm. your character is formed yes. and the artificial way. Yeah, that's And good. manipulation arguments, at least – probably most, maybe all of them, they tend to artificially manipulate your character. Yes. Right. And that's what Fisher would say then you're, you're not taking ownership of that. So it's not, it's not satisfying the condition of mechanism ownership. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's great. That that's exactly right. And, and yeah, that, that natural way um, in like within the story, uh, James Anderson says, you know, intranarratively within the story, mm -hmm. um, that that would be the God given condition. He's he's creating his characters. He's forming them. There there might be kind of a soul building uh, aspect there, uh, uh, defense against evil. But yeah, uh, the the mechanical way. Even so, even if you were like a bad storyteller, it might be a kind of mechanical way. If the the plot mm -hmm. needed you to jump ahead and and you didn't have enough time and you wrote it in, well, that doesn't really fit with the story at all. But that's right. not God. God's the best storyteller in the world. And uh, well, in outside the world too, you know, like he's, he's God. So exactly. yeah, I think it all kind of comes yeah. together. It's, it's been, uh, I, I just did a, uh, interview with, um, with Scott Christensen about, uh, his, his new book, what about evil? And he hmm. gives a, uh, he gives a theodicy, um, which is really bold, but he gives a theodicy, uh, a greater glory theodicy. And I think that really fits in again with this, the story that God is telling the best story ever. So why hmm. is there evil in the world? Well, because, uh, because of the ultimate purpose of God glorifying himself going with the Edwards motif there, but right. and, he's, and he's telling this, this story, which is a, a comedy, not a tragedy. And so, I mean, ultimately the story is about the author entering in and becoming Christ. So right. I, it's all kind of coming together for me and all you guys have come on to help. So oh, great. Um, this, it's been, it's been so fantastic. Um, so that sourcehood condition, if it's uh, what, what, what the authors say it is. Um, I agree that we need to deny it. Um, and, and you have tied this back. This is what's really cool about you again, because you are historically informed, but you're bringing it up to date. You've argued that from the Westminster confession of faith, um, th th that we ought to deny sources. Yes. Um, right. is that, is that fresh in your mind that you can kind of help us see that? Um, it's fresh enough. I think, uh, <laughs> essentially, you know, Maybe I should actually read that, huh? <laughs> I forget the exact language. Sorry, I have to put on my reading glasses. No worries. What happens no worries. when you get old? <laughs> well, um, and and you've said that that uh, not only should we deny sources, but that we should you you argue for th uh, theological determinism. Right. Yeah. So theological determinism would just be the idea. Uh, well, really, what the Reformed Orthodox would call hypothetical necessity. Mm. Uh, in the book, I quote. Uh, Robert Kane from, from his introduction to free will, which is an, an excellent introduction. I don't know if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. at all. It came out like in 2006, but he, he gives a good definition of uh, determinism. And he says, you know, determinism, the way it's used nowadays is not absolute necessity. It's mm -hmm. conditional or hypothetical necessity. Uh, and this is what the reformed Orthodox would call uh, the necessity of the consequence. Have you ever heard of that language mm -hmm. before? So, and this is also another way in which I think Mueller is kind of misunderstanding what determinism is. He seems to have an understanding that determinism is absolute necessity. Yeah. So he'll talk about it in terms of like the principle of plentitude, you know, in mm -hmm. early in, in that book. But, um, okay, I think I have one here, uh, an argument. It says, uh, unpreventably, if God decrees Adam to fall, then Adam will fall. And that's derived from Westminster Confession 3.1 and the larger Catechism 12. Premise 2, unpreventably, God decreed Adam to fall. Mm -hmm. Westminster Confession 5.4, larger Catechism 12. Conclusion, unpreventably, Adam falls. Uh, this yeah. is from Premise 1 and 2 and, and the modal transfer principle. And the, the gist of it is just that if the confession affirms things like that, but also affirms them 
for whatsoever comes to pass that God does this, then the only conclusion you can draw is that theological determinism is true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I love it, man. That's good. That's good. I uh, I, I think we need more people doing this too, uh, like historically uh, rooted, grounded, uh, obviously in scripture, but but also in some confessions would be great. And just saying like, this is what right. they believed and we don't have to just relegate it to the dustbin of history. It's not something that we just believe on Sunday, but then, you know, I'm back in, in uh, school with my philosophy friends. We're laughing and joking about how I don't believe that. Like, no, it, just bring it up to date, man. Just do it. It's, it's right. These guys were geniuses, uh, you know, the, the Westminster divines. Um, right. th- what they said is applicable today. You just have to do a little bit of work of updating it. Yeah. I, I, what, what's been amazing to me in, in the process of researching this and writing this book is, is just how relevant they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, their concepts in so many ways map on to contemporary analytic philosophy. And it, it, by, by making that kind of translation into contemporary categories, you, you really show the depth of their thinking. Um, yeah. And, and you and you show the usefulness of continuing to go back to those resources and mine them. Uh, that that's one of the purposes of the book too that I wanted to to get at is look we have all these wonderful theologians in our tradition. We need to go back and we need to be mining from them yeah. and taking those things and using them today. Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, like the retrieval theology. Is that yes? Is, yes. is this is this I know it's probably not the, the main emphasis, but is this an act of retrieval theology? If I'm understanding it correctly, yeah, I would say that. Uh, uh, I'm going back to the Reformed Orthodox theologians. I'm taking what they said uh, about free will and taking it into contemporary analytic philosophy. So I'm retrieving what they're saying and recasting it in modern day language. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, man. I, I love that. I love that project. I love, I love, Again, like you said, uh, real, realizing how brilliant these guys were. Mm. Uh, and then every now and then you find something just completely new, uh, which like uh, there's been a retrieval of the doctrine of immensity, that God is oh, yeah. immense. And I'm like, I've heard that before, but not really. I never really focused on it. Uh, but but yeah, it's that's a huge that's a huge thing. And it's a really cool doctrine when you start realizing it. And mm-hmm. to think that, you know, Turretin talks about it all the time uh, and it's just in there and, and, and all these these dudes knew what immensity was and we lost it. So it's, I love uh, retrieval. I think it's great. Uh, right. Moving on to the census divinitatis. Um, how does that fit within your, your framework of, of mechanism ownership? Yeah. Well, this was one of the, a good example of what I was just talking about, how looking at what old theologians thought maps nicely onto what new philosophers, contemporary philosophers think today. Uh, the census divinitatis is basically the idea that God implants a knowledge of himself and of his law within our hearts, mm-hmm. within our being in some way, shape, or form. It's part of what it means to be created in God's image. Mm-hmm. But some of the implications of that really line up nicely uh, along the lines of the subjectivist condition or the mechanism ownership uh, aspect of guidance control. Because what that implies is that you're not God, you are actually an agent distinct from God. Mm -hmm. So you have the first aspect there, you are an agent, but you're also um, an apt target of God's reactive attitudes towards you because he created you as a responsible being. He told you what his law was, what you are to do and what you are not to do. And so you're accountable to that. Mm -hmm. And then it's also based on the evidence. This is the third condition of uh, the subjectivist condition that Fisher and Revisa don't really talk much about, but it actually fits nicely in, in this perspective because you would be basing the idea that you are an agent and the idea that you are an apt target of the reactive attitudes on the knowledge that God has implanted in you. Mm-hmm. So it's that knowledge of his law and of his existence that forms the basis or the evidence, as Fisher and Revisa would say, for those other two conditions. Mm, okay. So, um, so then you're taking uh, the the census divinitatis or tatus, uh in what I would say is more more Calvinistic, uh, right? More more, more uh, yeah, thoroughly. It's not planting as faculty, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. As much as I like planting guy, I just don't agree with his interpretation on Calvin. Though. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. So so for those who uh, are unaware, 
uh, Alvin Plantinga, a uh, super famous dude, really great uh, scholar, good uh, philosopher, not as good of a theologian, I'd say probably, but uh, he he has this uh, conception of the census divinitatis, which is original to Calvin, but uh, that language, but probably not the uh, the actual idea itself. I think that can be found other places, but uh, he, he says that that the sense is like a sense like my eyes. And so my, or uh, my olfactory sense or, or different senses like that. And so there's a sense that, that gives you knowledge of God and it can be broken. And so it doesn't give you knowledge of God. But uh, what, what Michael's talking about here, and I think more accurate to the Reformed tradition is that the sense of the divine, the sense of divinitatis is actually implanted knowledge. It is knowledge that you do have. Um, and, and then that actually works really nicely with the rest of the conception of, of free will that you have there. That's right. Which, which is great. So the, I'm wondering. I'm 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 putting on my Armenian hat here and thinking with the uh, the subjectivist uh, principle there. Um, I, I keep forgetting. I keep calling it principle. What, what's it called again? Subjectivist. Um, they refer to it as the subjectivist condition. Condition. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So with that subjectivist condition and accountability with the divine decree. So God has has decreed. Um, it, well. Maybe, maybe this would be a great a great time for you to talk about like the the two wills of God, um, because God has decreed that uh, you know I will do everything that I've done so far, but He's also told me not to lie, cheat, and steal. But right. part of the decree included me lying and cheating and stealing in right. my past, and so I am morally culpable for it. But I couldn't have done otherwise. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, you know, our listeners, especially the Armenian listeners, will say, well, that doesn't seem like it's fair. It doesn't seem like you can be held morally responsible if you couldn't have done otherwise. Right. And so it's bringing this back to Pat, but, but how do you, how do you react to that? Yeah. I mean, so there are a number of things. Um, one, you can go to things like Frankfurt examples and other things that would, would show in my opinion that uh, the ability to do otherwise in that sense is actually not necessary for moral responsibility. Mm-hmm. But also I would say, as I said earlier, y- you do have a general power to do otherwise is yeah. just you, you can't thwart God's specific decree. Yeah. Um, and, and that really is necessary because how, how can I describe this? We, we wouldn't hold like a brick morally responsible for uh, not saving a drowning baby that it was just sitting there. Right. So you have this right. brick sitting by the pond and the baby's drowning and you're yelling at the brick cause it didn't save the baby. Well, <laughs> the brick doesn't have the power to get up and go save the baby, but a human being does, yeah. right? And so that is actually part of the ground of moral responsibility is having that general power to do otherwise. Yeah. Um, but the only thing that's being denied here is that specific uh, power of, den- of uh, being able to thwart God's decree. Mm-hmm. And I would just look at what the scriptures say. I mean, the scriptures do declare that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass. You know, yeah. even the, the death of Christ, it says in, in the book of Acts, that it was a, uh, uh, he was delivered up according to the predetermination of God. Uh, he yeah. uses that specific language. So I think from a biblical perspective, the Bible is pretty clear on that, but also you can have these arguments like Frankfurt examples that kind of, um, minimize or maybe even withdraw the intuition that you need to have the ability to do otherwise in order to be morally responsible. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, the, the most famous, I think you've used the, uh, the politician, yeah, the political one as well. Mm-hmm. You go in to vote and uh, let's just call him Harry Frankfurt. Harry Frankfurt is yeah. this evil scientist. He puts a chip in my brain and says, I'm going to vote for uh, Donald Trump or whatever. And, uh, I'm already choosing to, to, I want to, I've gone in there hoping or wanting to uh, pull the lever for, for Trump, but the uh, Frankfurt wants me to as well. And so he wants to make sure that I never, I don't choose otherwise. So I got this chip, I go in there and I vote for Trump based on my own desires and the chip doesn't have to go off. So I didn't have the ability to not, uh, I didn't have this alternate possibility of not voting for Trump, but I did it without any manipulation. And so Mm -hmm. I'm still morally responsible for it. So bringing that over to, to me lying, stealing and cheating in God's story here, I couldn't have done otherwise, but I wanted to do it. And that's why I'm morally culpable. And I I think that, I think that this is intuitive when we look at like our court system. Um, That's right. I I think, yeah, Scott Christensen wrote, he wrote this book, uh, what about free will? And I think he talks about this here, but in our court system, we don't say, you know, you hit this guy with your car. Did you have the ability to do otherwise? 
Oh, mm-hmm. you you didn't. So no, you're not responsible. No, we look at the intentions. Did you mean to? That's right. Was, yeah. was this was this intended? Did you plan it yesterday? Because that's first degree murder. But right. did, or were you drunk? Okay, well that's negligence. But we have different laws for that, or or whatever it is, um, impaired driving, or were you texting? That's going to be less than drinking and driving, and and the intentions matter there, right? Yes, that's. I mean, it, it, it's basically in line with moderate reasons responsiveness, right? Mm-hmm. It's saying, you know, what were your reasons for doing it? Mm. Uh, and do you, do you take ownership of those reasons? Yeah. Right. And in all those cases, if you came across somebody who maybe was insane and didn't believe they were an agent, then they would give a, an insanity defense, right? In yeah. order to get him to not go to jail. So, yeah, I think you're exactly right that it meshes very nicely with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, it, with hitting someone with your car, if, if someone hits your car and they hit and then you hit someone again, it's like you're not even culpable at all because it, right. it wasn't your reason. It wasn't. Right. Any, yeah. It was just cause and effect there. Um, wow, that's really helpful. So um, we talked about how guidance control is compatible with with reform theology. But is it um, the only model that is compatible? Mm-hmm. Like ought every reformed believer uh, hold to this guidance control? It, you know, as they reflect on the, uh, philosophy, I, right. I know that grandma Susie is not going to probably hold a group, you know, <laughs> maybe she will. She's pretty smart. But, but, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what, what yeah, that's think? a great question. Uh, well, it's one of the, at the beginning of the book, I kind of give a little bit of an explanation as to why I called it a reformed view of freedom, as opposed to the reformed view of yeah. freedom. And, and the idea there is that, once you deny the source condition and the alternative possibilities condition, you're now in the realm of compatibilism. Mm. And there is a number of different compatibilist views out there that would be compatible with reform theology. I, I picked Fisher and Revisa's model because it's probably one of the more highly regarded. I mean, even libertarians will say, oh, yeah, you know, they, they did good work, Fisher mm. and Revisa. So um, I picked that. And, and I, I like it. I think it's, a, it's an interesting theory. I mean, I, I'm sure there needs to be development and tweaking in, in various places. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to other people for the time being to do that. But um, no, they don't have to hold to guidance control. Uh, it's one possibility amongst many. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's freedom. Uh, and there's a number of resources that are available, which is another motivation that for writing the book, because I wanted to show theologians in the Reformed tradition is, look, there's this pile of literature out there yeah that is just waiting to be mined so let's get to work doing that and seeing how we can use that to construct models of freedom um it's interesting i, I didn't originally intend to write this particular book i, I intended to to write a, a book developing a model of reformed uh, freedom which is probably going to be the next book but mm-hmm. then i realized that people are actually questioning whether or not Reform theology is determinism or compatibilism. So I thought, well, this needs to be done first yeah. and establish that and, and the compatibility of this literature with reform theology and then move on in the project. Yeah. And and uh, lest anyone be confused right now, uh, uh, Michael said, you know, is is reform theology uh, determinism or compatibilism? Like in one sense, yes. You know, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's theological determinism, uh, but we still have, uh, we're still morally responsible. And so right. this distinction might be drawn out uh, between like Calvinist and hyper Calvinist. Mm. And, and and I don't know how many hyper Calvinists are still out there anymore. I try to unfriend them as much as possible, <laughs> but that's the view that like, yeah, you no, know, we're not morally responsible. God has completely determined everything. We don't have any free choice or anything like that. And, uh, and that's okay. And so, mm. you know, he's just in control and it's a really, really, really high view of God, which is, cool but it's it's high to the point of actually like uh damaging uh christian theology you know and a theology yeah. of, of humanity or anthropology as well so uh revealed anthropology if if anyone is hearing that noise that's my frog i have a bullfrog and he every time <laughs> he's croaking at me right now so it's not uh, any biological thing for me but uh so Michael, uh, I want to finish up with this question. Um, this is from from Caleb's review, and I thought it was a good question. Uh, good question. He says, "So, what problems uh, does guidance control help address in reform theology?" Mm. Yeah. Well, one is just the problem of us being irrelevant in the mm. contemporary scene if we're not going to kind of start updating our language into c- contemporary categories. Um, Another is I think there is promise there for manipulation cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, this 
mechanism ownership condition and a historicist view, it does seem to have promise. I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, like the hard line approach and the soft line approach to manipulation yeah. cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ultimately still think at this point that you know, we, we got to have the hard line approach uh, right there for us because it might be the case that um, the soft line approach might fail. I don't think I've seen it fail yet. And what I mean by that is I don't think uh, I've seen a manipulation case that does justice to guidance control uh, and then brings about the intu intuition that you're not morally responsible. E even Fisher's um, maybe about two or three years ago wrote a response to Paraboom's four case manipulation argument. Mm -hmm. And his argument was basically, look, you left out mechanism ownership. Yeah. And so you're not, you're not even touching my, my position. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that he's right. There. I mean, he, he, he did a lot more analysis than that, but that, that was one of the main responses. So I, I do think that might hold out some promise uh, in terms of, um, dealing with manipulation cases yeah that's that's really helpful um and again uh to to get that cash value you need to be reading up on arguments against theological or determinism which would apply right. to your theological determinism and so if you haven't uh, and this isn't against caleb at all or anything like that but but for someone who's saying you know well what what good is all this well it's good because you need to be, uh, it, it helps you stay up to date. Well, what, I don't care about being up to date. Well, okay, then <laughs> that's cool. But like, if you want to be witnessing to folks, uh, if you want to be theologically informed and philosophically, you know, rigorous, if you want to be reaching the culture, if you want to, you need to know, like, what does, how does my position translate over into different languages? Right. I, if I want to contextualize the gospel in the inner city, I'm going to learn the language they're speaking. If I want to contextualize right. the gospel, uh, in my theology to philosophers, I need to know the language they're speaking and see how it, it translates over. You do that in a new culture. And mm -hmm. so you do that in, in this culture as well. So, yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I'm, I'm sure there's others as well, but I think that's, that's helpful to say, look, um, someone can, can bring this manipulation argument against reformed theology and just, it's going to hurt if you don't know, uh, how to, how to counter this. And so right. this guidance control is a great way to preempt that and, to further elucidate your position and, and make it uh, believable, make it compelling for, for non-believers, for other believe, you know, uh, non-Calvinist believers. So uh, that's right. great. That was a great answer. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So um, Michael, uh, as we close up here, where can people find out more, more about you, more of your stuff? You got a whole website thing going. Yeah. I have a website that I, I had intended to actually use more than I actually have. Uh, at some point in the near future, I plan on doing that, but uh, mm -hmm. it, the website is uh, just michaelpreciato.com. Uh, and you have a little blurb up there about me. And I think it's Paul Helms forward to my book. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point I was going to do a podcast as, as well. And I still might eventually end up doing that. I just, Things have been pretty busy lately, so I, I haven't had a chance to do some of the things that I had intended to. So yeah, how about uh, how about your book? If someone wants to go and, and get your book, where can they get? Yeah, that? I mean, you can just get it on Amazon. Um, Amazon.com is called the Reform View of Freedom: The Compatibility of Guidance Control and Reform Theology. I actually just uh, my brother-in-law told me the hardback now is only sixteen dollars. The paperback Whoa. is thirty-six dollars. So that's a pretty good deal. That's a, that's a really good deal. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so so go and grab that right now, uh, Michael. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Yeah. This, this Thank has you been for having me. Good. We we gotta do part two. We gotta talk transcendental arguments. Good. Stuff. That'd be great. <laughs> Anytime. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, we uh, we talked about a lot here, and uh, Lord willing, we can talk about more in the future. But for now, it's gonna have to do it. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory.